104.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. I wasn't happy that our water was good before they started growing. And when I got done, it was bad. At one point, we could actually light on fire. Lighting tap water on fire is apparently not a magic trick. Some people claim it's just one of the gnarly effects that a natural gas drilling method called hydraulic fracturing has on the water supply. So it sounds like the goose that lays the golden egg, but the problem is the public hasn't heard about the problems that have yet to be solved. On this edition, we'll hear from residents who say their faucets have become fire hazards and about efforts to stop the toxic fallout of hydrofracking before it starts. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. The term hydraulic fracking sounds like scientific jargon, but lately it's becoming a household term. That's because this method of drilling for natural gas is generating widespread opposition in states across the country, from Pennsylvania to the mountains of Colorado. New York State, in particular, is a hotbed of opposition. Walter Hang of Toxics Targeting explains why. A lot of the natural gas that's proposed to be produced in America involves a giant rock formation called Marcellus Shale. And it goes from New York all the way west to Ohio, all the way south to Tennessee. The problem is that this rock contains natural gas in very tiny pores, but the rock is very deep. It's about a mile deep on average. And if you just drill a well into this rock, no gas comes out. You then have to drill through the rock, and then you have to use a technique called hydrofracturing, where you pump water under tremendous pressure into the rock, and it breaks it up. But this water also contains toxic chemicals and When you pump this out so you can begin to produce the gas, that flow back water has heavy metals, it has toxic chemicals, and believe it or not, it's actually radioactive and it's very salty. So we really have no capacity to get rid of this wastewater. So in effect, we'd be trading maybe some environmental benefits for huge environmental detriment. In a 2004 study, the Environmental Protection Agency said water in the area of the fracking process is safe to drink, and hydraulic fracking goes unregulated by federal authorities. In the face of public outcry, the EPA has agreed to conduct a new study of the impact of the drilling method on nearby drinking water. But while industry eyes the trillion-dollar Marcellus gas reserves, local groups aren't waiting for federal regulation. Hang says they're trying to prevent more of the drilling impacts they've already seen. In places like Pennsylvania, which is also on top of the Marcellus Formation, they did not want to pause. They went whole hog on Marcellus drilling, and now they've had all kinds of problems with fires, methane contamination, polluted water wells. This is exactly what I found in New York with traditional gas drilling. It's just very polluting. So the industry has not been regulated properly ever. And if we want to go into this new era of Marcellus gas, I believe we have to take precautions first, not allow it to happen, and then struggle to try to cope with the problems. We'll hear more from Hang later on in the show. Hydraulic fracking found its way into the media spotlight in June of 2010 when HBO premiered a movie called Gasland. The film is a documentary made by Josh Fox, a Pennsylvania resident who was approached by a gas company that wanted to buy the rights to what was under his family's land. Turns out he was living above the Marcellus shale field a huge untapped source of natural gas, one that can only be accessed using hydraulic fracturing. 
Fox turned down the company's offer and instead traveled across the country exploring the health and environmental consequences of hydrofracking. The result is a movie that won the special prize for Best Documentary at the Sundance Film Festival. The film has drawn some criticism for using editing to manipulate the viewer, but it's clearly got the energy industry concerned. A coalition of petroleum industry groups teamed up to launch a debunking Gasland campaign and populated Internet chat discussions with links to a site called Energy in Depth, which defends hydrofracking and other oil and gas extraction techniques. The Gaslands movie begins with some clips showing energy company executives and lobbyists giving testimony to Congress in 2009. They describe the benefits of the Marcellus Shale and other gas basins in the United States at a congressional subcommittee on energy and minerals. There are numerous deep shale gas basins in the United States which contain trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. In fact, North America's natural gas supply is so plentiful it has been described recently by some experts as a virtual ocean of natural gas. We believe the potential from these four major shale basins is enormous. And it is a game changer not only for America's natural gas industry, but also potentially for our nation, our economy, and our environment. I'm here today representing the 30 member states of the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission who produce 99% of our domestic oil and gas. Studies and surveys by GWPC, EPA, and IOGCC over the last 11 years have found no real credible threat to underground drinking water from hydraulic fracturing. Recently, however, there has been concern raised about the methods to tap these valuable resources. Technologies such as the practice of hydraulic fracturing have been characterized as environmentally risky and inadequately regulated. Press reports and websites alleging that six states have documented over 1,000 incidents of groundwater contamination resulting from the practice of hydraulic fracturing. Such reports are not accurate. And it's my firmly held view, and also that of IOGCC, that the subject of hydraulic fracturing is adequately re regulated by the states, and it needs no further study. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an overview. Thank you. Thank the committee. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> always. <laughs> you don't know what you just uh, thanked him for. Yeah. <laughs> Testimony like that, along with millions of dollars worth of lobbying, paid off in 2005 when oil and natural gas companies were exempted from important health and safety regulations. Throughout the film, producer Josh Fox focuses on former Vice President Dick Cheney, who convened a group of energy company executives and lobbyists behind closed doors to write a bill which became the United States Energy Policy. What would it mean if the United States and the rest of the world adopted natural gas as the fuel of the future? We've cracked the code for natural gas supply. And what I didn't know was that the 2005 energy bill pushed through Congress by Dick Cheney exempts the oil and natural gas industries from the Safe Drinking Water Act. They were also exempt from the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Superfund Law, and about a dozen other environmental and democratic regulations. And when the 2005 energy bill cleared away all the restrictions, companies like Encana, Williams, Cabot Oil and Gas, and Chesapeake began to use the new Halliburton technology, and they began the largest and most extensive domestic gas drilling campaign in history, now occupying 34 states. The method of gas drilling they use is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. It blasts a mix of water and chemicals 8,000 feet into the ground. The fracking itself is like a mini earthquake. The intense pressure breaks apart the rock and frees up the gas. In order to frack, you need some fracking fluid, a mix of over 596 chemicals, from the unpronounceable to the unknown to the too well known. The brew is full of corrosion inhibitors, gelants, drilling additives, biocides, shale control inhibitors, liquid breaker aids, viscosifiers, liquid gel concentrates, it's those hundreds of chemicals and their consequences on health that have raised the red flag about hydraulic fracturing. And it's the effects of those chemicals, some of them still unknown, that become the focus of the Gasland HBO movie. Now that we understand how the process works, Josh Fox takes us to meet some of his fellow Pennsylvanians who've had the hydrofracking process done in and around their water supply for years. What emerges is a pattern of sick people sick animals, and unanswered questions. The 
closest they were drilling to me was in a place called Dimmick, Pennsylvania, about 40 miles from the New York-Pennsylvania border in the Susquehanna River Basin. A company called Cabot Oil and Gas from out of Houston had drilled over 40 wells in just under a few months. It's a small place with no major highways, a place where you could easily forget the world, forget yourself, disappear completely. I was going there because I'd heard a lot of complaints and because I'd heard the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection had said that everything was going fine. The story of Dimmick starts with a frantic series of distress calls from Pat Farnelli. If Dimmick had a town square, she'd be standing in the middle shouting for help. Everywhere there's a gap in the trees, there's a well. There's like ten. <laughs> Sometimes it, it bubbles and hisses when it comes out. I highly recommend you that you do. You want to drink it? I won't drink it. When Cabot and them came in to get the water and they were telling me it was okay to drink, I said, well, here, go ahead and drink it. And they wouldn't drink it. There were days when four kids were out of school sick. Everybody was sick, pretty, including me. We were all, our stomachs were really, really acting up, couldn't handle eating anything for over a month, right? And then Jean, next door, talked to me at church and said, did you notice anything funny about your water? Our well's gone bad. The maze, they have bad water, and uh, they've got a newborn in the house. My next trip was just up the road to Ron and Jean Carter's. They had a gas well in their front yard. Shortly after the well was drilled, their water started bubbling and fizzing. It turned out to be natural gas. I told them that I wasn't happy, that our water was good before they started drilling. And when they got done, it was bad. We said, asked if we could prove that it was because of them. And my wife asked the guy if he could prove that it wasn't. He wouldn't talk to her anymore. <laughs> We lived here 40 years, and the water never had a problem with the water. And uh, they drilled. After they drilled, the water was bad. My next trip was just up the street. Norma Fiorentino's water well exploded on New Year's Day. You're kidding. This is my daughter-in-law calling. She's saying there's a special on at noon. DEP says cabin oil and gas has polluted more than a dozen water wells. Drilling for natural That's my gas front yard. in Susquehanna County. Well, I've lived next to these people for 30 or 40 years. And we're good friends, all of us. And we just have the same problem. The problems with hydrofracking being described weren't unknown by either industry or the government. Josh Fox managed to track down an environmental protection agency employee named Weston Wilson, who was willing to speak to him about what the agency knew, kind of. I will put Weston Wilson not speaking on behalf of the EPA, although he works for the EPA. In 2004, the EPA was investigating a water contamination incident due to hydraulic fracturing in Alabama. But a panel rejected the inquiry, stating that although hazardous materials were being injected underground, EPA did not need to investigate. Weston Wilson, a 20-year veteran of the EPA, wrote a letter to Congress objecting. He also noted that on the peer review panel that authored the report, five of seven members appeared to have conflicts of interest and would benefit from the EPA's decision not to conduct a further investigation. They came out with the patently... Uh, ridiculous conclusion. They had showed it was toxic and then said it wasn't a risk. It made no sense and only in an Orwellian world would you accept that. From 1995 until 2000 when he became vice president, Dick Cheney was the CEO of Halliburton. One of the first things he did when he became vice president was to form what was known as the Energy Task Force. They met up to 40 times with industry leaders. They only met once with members from environmental groups. The Energy Task Force and a $100 million lobbying effort on behalf of the industry were significant in the passage of what's called the Halliburton Loophole to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which authorizes oil and gas drillers exclusively to inject known hazardous materials unchecked directly into or adjacent to underground drinking water supplies. It passed as a part of the Bush administration's Energy Policy Act of 2005. So what are the measurable health impacts of hydrofracking? The answers weren't easy to find. As Gasland continues, Josh Fox talks to Theo Colburn, who's recognized for her research on the chemical composition of hydrofracking fluid and its effects on human beings. At first, you may just have headaches. 
then the next thing you might have ringing in your ears. I thought I had an inner ear infection. I went to my doctor and she's kind of, your ears are clean. Or you may be a little disoriented or you may feel a little dizzy. So they sent me down for a CAT scan. But eventually you may feel what is called peripheral neuropathy. And when you get to this stage, you have irreversible brain damage. For the last four years, I have these lesions in my brain. I don't know where they came from. You may begin to get swelling. I hurt everywhere in my body. My legs, my feet, everywhere. Your extremities, especially the arms and the legs. I shouldn't move. I shouldn't reach my face to eat. And never know where the pain is going to be. The pain can be excruciating. Think about the workers or the people whose yards or backyards or within a thousand feet of their home have a well pad. They can't get rid of the tanks and the fumes are all the time. They're inhaling these chemicals 24-7 around the clock. As the HBO movie Gasland comes to a close, Josh Fox emerges from his cross-country journey shocked, angry, and more than anything, frightened that the beautiful landscape of his childhood and the health of his neighbors is under imminent threat. He's also discovered that the issue goes way beyond Pennsylvania. The Frank Act is making its way through Congress, and industry is lobbying hard against it. Neither New York State nor Pennsylvania have moved to protect the watersheds. I don't know what's going to happen around here. I don't know if all this is going to be destroyed. I don't know what's going to happen around the rest of the United States. And with major shale plays being discovered in Europe and in North Africa, and with hydraulic fracturing being hailed there as a possible solution to Europe's energy problems, I don't think this story is going away anytime soon. As possible, the gas land might stretch a little bit further than my backyard into yours. Ready? You've been listening to clips from the HBO movie Gasland. For more information, you can log on to gaslandthemovie.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. We now return to No Frackin' Way, The Perils of Natural Gas Drilling. When hydraulic fracturing makes it to HBO prime time, it's pretty fair to say there's some buzz. But it's only come after years of campaigning. Political leaders and ordinary citizens across the country have been working hard to prevent the film's grim scenarios from spreading. And with help from the publicity surrounding the Gasland movie, they're having some success. In March 2010, the Environmental Protection Agency agreed to reassess the impact of hydraulic fracking on drinking water. Their study should be complete by 2012. Reporter Rachel Zurer has more on local citizen initiatives to stop the negative impacts of hydraulic fracturing, ideally before they even start. Battlement Mesa, Colorado boasts spectacular scenery on the banks of the Colorado River. It's also a hotbed of natural gas activism. Though it doesn't look it, in a sense, Battlement Mesa, Colorado, has always been a community focused on energy. In the 1980s, Exxon carved out this unincorporated corner of western Colorado to be a company town. Then Exxon's oil shell drilling project collapsed. Battlement Mesa reinvented itself as the perfect place to retire. The thing that I hear from everybody in Colorado when I say I live in Battle of Mesa, they say, do you play golf? Because the golf course here is one of the highly rated courses in Colorado. That's Paul Light. He's a 78-year-old former social scientist from Philadelphia who took the retirement bait. In 2004, he and his wife bought a home in Battlement Mesa where they planned to spend the rest of their lives. If I knew then what I know now, we would never have purchased the house here. What Light knows now is that in a way, Battlement Mesa never stopped being an energy community. 
though the subdivision has grown to over 5,000 residents, all the mineral rights that Exxon once owned are still active throughout the area. And in summer 2009, a company called Antero Resources announced that it planned to drill for natural gas right within Battlement Mesa. It was really a surprise to about, uh, I think maybe 400 people or so gathered in the um, activity center gym to hear this report from Antero. That night, we learned that uh, our future would involve 200 natural gas wells um, to be drilled over several years, uh, starting uh, as opposed to start this year. But because of some of the questions we raised, that's been delayed. The we light is referring to is Battlement Concerned Citizens, a group of around 75 residents, mostly retirees, who felt angry at the prospect of having natural gas wells as close as 500 feet from their homes. Many had heard horror stories from people living near wells elsewhere in the county. Stories of leaks, explosions, health problems, drinking water contamination. This 2004 home video uploaded by one concerned resident nearby shows someone lighting a local creek on fire. All right, ready? The video shows a man in a sleeveless vest placing an aluminum funnel over a spot where gas bubbles up from the creek bank. He lights a match, and the funnel flares like a volcano. Now, this is 12 inches high, and the flame's going up probably another 12 inches, so you got two feet there. Being able to light a local creek on fire was just one of the things that led the group of Battlement Mesa citizens to take action. They decided to petition county and state authorities to ensure that residents would stay safe and healthy if and when drilling started. Here's light again. We could probably carry a petition and and get a lot of signatures for people to say, we don't want any drilling here, but it wouldn't have any effect. Uh, This was one that we felt might make a difference. And so people, we we got the signatures by a group of um, probably 20 or 30 people just carrying them in all the neighborhoods, um, asking people if they wanted to sign um, with a handout explaining what we were asking for. And we did that within a few days. The petition worked. The county agreed to fund a health assessment to be completed in time for consideration as part of Antero's permitting process. Rachel Waldholtz is a reporter who covered the situation in Battlement Mesa for the Western environmental magazine, High Country News. She says that though the study won't be binding on anyone, it's still a pretty big deal. This is the first time that regulators have had to make this decision with a detailed health study in front of them. Normally, health isn't sort of taken into account quite this formally. In addition to setting an important precedent, the Battlement Mesa study could help address a larger issue. Waldholtz points out that nationwide, there's a lack of studies about the impacts of natural gas drilling on the folks who live nearby. Researchers know, you know, they'll know some of the chemicals that are used, so they'll know some of the health impacts of some of those chemicals, but they don't really know sort of like how much people are exposed to or over what time period or at what concentration or what all those chemicals do if you're exposed to all of them together. The Battlement Concerned Citizens hope the county health assessment and a second longer-term study the county has agreed to will help start to fill in those information gaps. But if scientists don't know exactly how gas drilling affects people, at least part of the blame goes to the fact that under federal law, energy companies are not required to reveal what chemicals they're using for fracking. Morris Hinchy, a Democratic congressman from New York State, wants to change that. Hinchy is one of the sponsors of federal legislation called the Frack Act, which would require such disclosure. If you're going to be drilling for materials and you are inserting uh, chemicals in the context of your drilling, you have to be honest about what you're doing. You have to tell publicly what you are injecting into the ground. The Frack Act would also undo a regulatory loophole created by the 2005 Energy Policy Act, which exempts the fracking industry from the rules of the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is uh, one of the main responsibilities of government, to make life safe and, uh, and secure, make it healthy, make it positive in as many ways as possible. 
The Frack Act seems to have stalled in committee in the face of strong opposition from the fracking industry. It may be that for now, the most effective pushback against the dangers of hydraulic fracturing will happen at the state level. Wyoming has passed regulations which, like the Frack Act, require that companies divulge what's in the fracking fluids they use. And in Hinchy's home state of New York, a heated fight is rolling. New York State has never been a major energy producer, but experts say hydraulic fracturing could unlock an enormous natural gas supply from the Marcellus Shale Formation, which lies underneath much of the southwest part of the state, including the area that supplies the drinking water to New York City. In January 2010, protesters filled the lobby of the New York State Capitol in Albany, demanding a moratorium on horizontal hydrofracking. Bills to do just that sit in the legislature, unlikely to move. So many activists are concentrating their energies not on new laws, but on the arcane twists and turns of bureaucracy. Wes Gillingham, program director of Catskill Mountain Keeper, explains. New York's regulations were outdated, so we pressured the governor to do a supplemental to the generic environmental impact statement, basically the permit conditions that um, industry has to follow when they are applying for putting in the development. Plans for major new fracking developments are on hold for now, while officials at New York's DEC, or Department of Environmental Conservation, create regulations specific to fracking. Last year's draft of the new rules assumed that existing drilling regulations were keeping people safe. But Walter Hang says that's a false premise based on what he dug up in government documents about drilling sites in New York. He runs a data mining business called Toxics Targeting. And what we found was that there had been literally hundreds and hundreds of fires, explosions, homes that had to be evacuated, polluted water supply wells, and a whole host of uh, pollution releases that had never really come to light. Hang criticized the agency's new rules in a letter which called for the DEC to start over from scratch. That letter has now been signed by nearly 10,000 people. Even the Federal Environmental Protection Agency weighed in, recommending the DEC revise its regulations in partnership with the New York Department of Health. Hang again. So it remains to be seen whether or not, you know, the de facto moratorium will continue, you know, and for how long, given that this entire draft may be withdrawn. That's what we're really pushing for. Hang says the last time the state overhauled its energy rules, the process took 12 years. From the halls of Congress to the golf course of Battle Mesa, efforts to rein in the dangers of fracking all seem to have one thing in common, information. Having it is power, and asking for more seems to be the best tactic anyone has found. As the term hydraulic fracturing moves from the pages of Natural Gas World to the pages of the New York Times, citizens are demanding the right to know what's happening in their communities and in their bodies. And they're hoping their governments get the message. It's government's job to keep citizens safe. For Making Contact, I'm Rachel Zurer. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Special thanks to Josh Fox, the producer of Gasland, and to Alton Bird, who helped write this show. Check out our website at radioproject.org to get our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. The following candidate statements belong to the author of the statement only. I'm Cynthia Johnson, and I'm excited about the possibility of serving on the local station board. KPFA gives us great information, and an informed citizenry is essential for social change. I'm hopeful that even in this challenging moment, we listener sponsors can bring our unique gifts to this vital media institution. I'm with the Independence for Community Radio, voteindyradio.org, for accountability, transparency, and strategic thinking. Hi, my name is Tanya Russell. I'm an African-American woman and live in East Oakland. My father helped to build the original transmitter in the mid-40s. 
I'm running for the local station board because our station is in deep trouble. We can save our station by temporarily cutting over 